Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Christian Moorline. I'm going to talk about uh, my passion, um, uh, revitalization efforts in uh, the uh, historic brewery district, uh, brewing culture in Cincinnati, and uh, what I decided to do about it myself. Um, but first, I want to give you a little history. Christian Moorline is actually uh, a real live uh, German immigrant. He's the quintessential German uh, immigrant story. story from the uh, early to mid 1800s after the Napoleonic Wars uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, the, the, he was seeking opportunity. He came to America, um, started a brewery on Elm Street called the Christian Moorline Brewing Company. Uh, with that, it uh, became the largest uh, brewer beer uh, in the state of Ohio, in Cincinnati, fourth largest brewer in the United States. All of that ended with the noble experiment called Prohibition in 1919, where gutted the economic life blood out of over the Rhine because you had all these great breweries and then whoosh, next day gone, no commerce. So uh, um, basically uh, the brand uh, didn't come back after prohibition in 1932, but uh, in 1981, a little brewery called the Hootapole Brewing Company, which is uh, at the time uh, uh, was located on Guest Street. You may have seen the smokestacks that say Hootapole on it. Uh, in addition, uh, the original brewery was started on McMicken, and believe it or not, parts of it still stand today. It says Hootapole Brewing Company on the top of it. You can actually see it from the current Christian Moorline Brewing Company. But in 1981, the Hootapole Brewing Company decided that they couldn't compete against big national players, uh, which at the time were uh, Miller, uh, it was uh, Coors, it was uh, Budweiser, uh, it was uh, Pabst. And uh, they decided that they couldn't uh, compete against the big national players, so they had to do it a different way. And they decided to brew what at the time was known as better beer. Uh, the craft beer category hadn't really started yet, and uh, there was uh, premium beers, which was like Bud and Udipol Amber Lagers and, and uh, Miller Lite and brands like that, but then there was, there was uh, super premium beers at the time, which was known as Michelob and Lowenbrow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then there, then there was better beers. They were even better than the super premiums because they didn't have a craft beer category. And um, Christian Moorline was uh, brewed as a better beer because they could charge more for it. And unlike the big national players that maybe only had to have two guys on a line to produce product, Udipole had to have five or six. So they weren't gonna win the battle of efficiency and they decided to start selling better beer, and uh, uh, they came out with Christian Moorline to great success, and it was, uh, it's known as one of the pioneer craft beers of today's craft beer movement. Um, the, it was the uh, first commercially sold craft beer east of the Mississippi, where the brand west of the Mississippi, which was the first craft beer, was Ankerstein, uh, owned by a gentleman by the name of Fritz Maytag, uh, yes, of Maytag Washer fame, and later Maytag Blue Cheeses, same guy. Um, and, uh, but uh, those were really the two pioneer uh, craft beers. Uh, Christian Moorline through the Udipole Brewing Company uh, did something uh, really unique. They, uh, there was no American beer that passed the German purity law and they submitted Christian Moorline to the German uh, the government and asked that it be uh, uh, declared Reinheitsgebot pure. And the Reinheitsgebot was the first uh, Consumer Protection Act. It's a German purity law of 1516. And in 1984, Christian Moorline received a letter from the German government. And when you buy the brand, like I did in 2004, they hand you all the recipes and they hand you this little letter that says, you are the first American beer to pass the German purity law. Um, and so uh, these were the claims to fame of uh, Christian Moorline in the early days, uh, but the company fell on hard times. Um, Udipole merged with Shaneling Brewing Company uh, up on Central Parkway, which is now the Boston Beer Company. And they went on as uh, Udipole Shaneling uh, for about uh, 10 years. And then the Boston Beer Company bought them, uh, bought them out and still produced their brands of beer in Cincinnati. Um, and that contract ran out in 2001. And when it ran out, uh, Cincinnati's brand, Cincinnati beer brands like uh, uh, Udipole and Little Kings and UD Delight and, and uh, um, um, 
all sorts of uh, all the Christian moor lines, they weren't brewed in Cincinnati anymore. So in 2001, uh, all those brands, uh, mo uh, um, they were sold off and uh, they were bought by out of town owners who brewed the beer out of town and they sold the beer in town. And in 2004, um, I was the uh, president and CEO of a, uh, the largest privately owned German brewery by the name of Warsteiner, uh, Warsteiner for those of you that uh, are, are German. And uh, uh, I ran their US operations and I was very successful at it. I had worked for them for 18 years or 17 plus years from 1987 until 2004. And I saw an opportunity to bring back Cincinnati's uh, brewing heritage because our first beer distributor in town um, was Udipol Shaneling Distributing Company, which was the was the uh, wholly owned subsidiary uh, uh, of the brewery, and they 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 sold only only their products plus some others, and one of them was Warsteiner. So I saw um, in. 1987, uh, I literally uh, uh, heard and saw, well, it was about 1985 uh, that I came from Ohio University. I was working at a beer distributor at the time. And uh, I, I actually came here and they told us that they were closing the brewery. So it was kind of like, why would you bring me on a sales call to tell me you're closing your brewery? But then in 1987, uh, they did close that brewery on Guest Street and they merged with Shane Ling. Um, and then, uh, I, so I saw a lot of people lose their jobs in the production brewing business in Cincinnati. Then I saw when Udipol Shaneling merged, um, you know, I saw a lot of people lose their jobs there. And then I saw when Boston Beer bought them out, I saw even more people lose their jobs. Then I saw when the distributing company, Udipol Shaneling Distributing closed, I saw all those people lose their jobs. So I was starting to think it was me for a while. Everybody that hung out with me was losing their job. But um, I saw an opportunity to return Cincinnati's Grand Brewing heritage, and uh, it became uh, my passion. And uh, I felt like uh, I had a great track record um, of a, uh, as a beer professional. Uh, at that time, it was about 24 years of being a professional in the brewing industry. I'd sold beer literally all over the world. I opened up every single major market for Varsteiner in the United States, uh, from New York City to Chicago to Los Angeles to San Francisco to you name it, I, I did it. Um, traveled all over the world to great Formula One races because Varsteiner sponsored Formula One at the time and that was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, uh, But uh, I felt like I was a, uh, um, I, I'm, I was basically in a position where I wanted to return Cincinnati's uh, Grand Brewing heritage, and I wanted to revitalize Cincinnati's brewing heritage and, the, and our brewing culture here. And I came home one night and I told my wife, I said, honey, I wanna resign from Warsteiner and bring back Cincinnati's brewing heritage. And she said, that is a noble experiment. That's awesome. <laughs> And I was like, really? She said, no, I don't think it's a good idea at all. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> and I said, I've been known to be that way once in a while. Uh, and she said, oh, why would you do that? Like, you're, you, you brought Little Warsteiner all on the tagline because life is too short to drink cheap beer. That was their tagline. It, if you have a really good tagline, it'll make you the CEO of a company. Let me tell you, it's for sure. Uh, and uh, uh, I didn't even come up with that tagline, but I was the guy that actually got out of the hot tub and wrote it down at the time. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what happened was, is uh, she was like, you could retire. Like they, 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 they put a headquarters in Chicago for you, built you a brand new facility, and you said, I wanted to live in Cincinnati, and three years later, they, they put a beautiful facility in Westchester for you and everything. And I was like, you know, I, I couldn't, I, w I was like, I know, but I, I feel like I'm the only one that has the skill set and the knowledge, the institutional knowledge, and, and the history behind me to return Cincinnati's Grand Brewing traditions. And, and where my passion came from was, uh, in 2001, we had the, the riots in, 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 in Cincinnati, and I was in Germany at the brewery at the time. And everybody on, was coming into the office going, oh, hey, we're really sorry at what's happened in Cincinnati. Have you seen the news? And I was like, oh, that, that's an over the Rhine. They're crazy down there. I mean, we're up in Westchester, come on, you know? 
And all day long, this went on, where people said, oh, hey, we're really sorry about Cincinnati, and we're really, really, really sorry. Well, back in 2001, they used to give free alcohol on international flights, back and forth. And I used to just plow through a bunch of beer and alcohol and, and just to put myself asleep. And I did it like I normally did on the way back. And I woke up in the middle of this sleep and this premonition came to me that, wow, how stupid am I? They were talking about my community. Cincinnati, they didn't distinguish that Westchester was different than Cincinnati or Mason or Northern Kentucky. We're all Cincinnati. And I just felt at that point that I needed to get involved and make a change and make a difference and, and get involved in my community. And that's what this whole presentation is about, um, although it has a lot of fun stuff in it too. Um, and so back to my wife, I said, you know, I feel like Cincinnati has such a great brewing heritage and a tradition. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I know I can do this, but I feel like I'm the only guy that can do it. If I don't do it, all these brands will end up on the trash heap of great brands. And she said, oh, please tell me you have a plan. And I said, oh, yeah, I have a plan. <laughs> OK, well, can you tell it to me? Yeah, yeah, I got a plan. And right off the top of my head, I told her, this plan. And that plan was, well, I'm going to buy these beer brands and I'm going to bring them back to Cincinnati so they have local ownership again. And it means something. And she said, oh, that's great. That's good, Greg. You know, but that's not, you know, that's not the whole plan, is it? Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to reposition these brands and make them much more relevant to today's consumers. And she said, oh, okay, that's good. And I'm going to build my base of sales. She said, okay. Number three, I'm going to op open local brewing operations in Cincinnati's brewery district. And she's like, do they even have one? And I was like, oh, yeah, they have one. And then number four, I'm going to open the largest brew pub in the world on the banks of the Ohio River. And she was like, oh, God, help us. Are we really going to do this? I said, come on, let's go. So uh, I feel that uh, my passion was, you know, you, you lead by example, you follow your passion, but you have to have a plan. And I didn't write down, you have to also have a skill set that matches that plan. Because I see a lot of people say, I have an idea. I want to open a brewery. I said, do you even brew beer? I mean, it's, it's just, it's crazy. People say these things and they don't realize the magnitude of what's behind it. But if you are passionate, you follow your passion and you follow everything about doing beer. I started as a beer salesman. Then I, then I turned into a, a, a merchandiser and then a manager, then the general manager of a beer distributorship. Then I left and became an account manager for Warsteiner. And then I built my territory and I became a regional sales manager. Then they sent me to Germany for three months to learn how to brew beer. Then after they taught me how to brew beer, uh, then they told me how to do, sell draft beer and why all the aspects of that. Then after they taught me how to sell, do that, they sent me back to the United States and promoted me to a division manager. Then I rose up to vice president of sales. Then, um, uh, unexpectedly, in a business meeting, uh, the then president of the company resigned, and the Germans stood up and said, the next president of the company is Greg Hardman. <laughs> Unannounced. And if he will accept, we'll build him an office in Chicago. I said, I want to be in Cincinnati. No, 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 but it's Chicago, Mr. Hardman. I, never, I, I, I went back and forth for a long time. But I developed my skill set to get here. Okay, so that's what you have to do. You, you, whatever your passion is, you got to follow that passion and learn every aspect of everything before you jump because there's only that much of that around. Money, money, money. Uh, so in any event, I followed my passion. And uh, with that passion, with that passion, uh-oh, we're locked. Technical glitch. I was on a roll, man. <laughs> All right, with that passion, I became, uh, oh, click right there, okay. With that passion, um, I developed uh, the Moorline Loggers and Ales, uh, Cincinnati's Craft Beer, and I redeveloped all those brands. And this is what I did. 
I got a local artist. We uh, came out with our first brand called OTR in 2007. And uh, I remember go, walking into the agency at the time, and I never, ever used a full-time agency of record. I always had one that I run ideas by. And uh, I went into this agency called Rocket Science. Great guys, they're here in town. And I said, I want to call my first brand OTR. And they were like, we don't know if you're brilliant or crazy. I mean, is it going to be a gangster beer? And I was like, no, it's going to be a tribute to the way people brewed beer and over the Rhine in the 1800s and also a tribute to the renaissance that's happening. You remember this back in 2005 and six when I'm saying this to these people. And then you reposition the brands. And uh, along the way, we became uh, the second largest uh, Ohio-owned craft brewer. I'm independently owned. Uh, and number one in Cincinnati. And uh, we are uh, right now Cincinnati's craft brewer. Then you reposition the brands and you develop, uh, here we go again, there we go. And then you uh, redevelop in, into a whole seasonal lineup. Uh, and we have a local artist, Jim Effler. I tell him a little story uh, about a beer and I tell him a history story. And then Jim like does these little sketches for me and then we come up with the label. But I start with the story and the beer and although these all look whimsical, the stories behind each one of these brands are true Cincinnati stories, even though they're all whimsical um, in that. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, in addition to that, um, we kept, uh, we repositioned all of the major Cincinnati brands. Uh, we do own through Utapol Shaneling Brewing Company, which is a subsidiary of Christian Moorline. Christian Moorline, the craft brewer, owns the domestic beer brands. We're the only one in the country that does this. Uh, and uh, uh, we didn't let them die. We kept, we saved them and we brought back to life Utapol, America's Great Small Brewery. That was their tagline. And we brought back the Hootie Delight and the Little King's Cream Ale and the Burger. And uh, we sell these beers in 30 plus states. Now we only sell more line in Cincinnati and it's all brewed right up the street and over the Rhine at our, our brewery, which is on, uh, uh, on Moore Street. And, uh, uh, but we, uh, uh, we brought back all these brands and uh, uh, they're working out really well for us. It, it, then, uh, uh, then we, again, we, we, we brought to life, bigger than life, the Huda Pole. And uh, Huda Pole, it says you are now running low on battery. <laughs> I'm having all sorts of technical issues. Um, and then uh, Utapol, here's a great one for you. All these other beer barons that were, uh, came to Cincinnati, Moorline, Hauk, Vindisch, Mühlhauser, uh, on and on and on. Uh, they were all born in Germany, except for one guy, that guy. Ludwig Utapol was the first Cincinnati-born beer baron. He was born right here in Cincinnati. Now, his parents were German immigrants, but uh, he also started some of the singing societies. And uh, um, we, uh, we, we brought this beer out um, to, as a tribute uh, to the uh, Hudapol Brewing Company on their 125th anniversary. And uh, when, we, when we positioned the product, we knew this Pennsylvania brand, Yinling, was coming to town. And we knew we had to have a brand that was better than Yinling. So what did we do? We went and got 30 Yinling drinkers and we put them in a room and they all thought they were drinking Yinling and we said, we want you to try these two beers. And one was Utapol Amber Lager, a non-adjunct Reinheitsgebot Pure all malt product that we developed a really great recipe on. And one was the beer they said they drank, Yinling, with the freshest code date we could find. And we poured them together and we asked everybody in the room which beer they liked better. And 29 out of 30 people said, that beer right there. And I looked over at the brewer and said, that's the recipe. Uh, followed by, then we showed them what it was, and they were all like, oh my gosh, you know, they couldn't believe it. And we, you know, and, and uh, we told them all the history and the story, and uh, it got very favorable reviews. And now we uh, do a whole lineup of uh, these brands uh, right here. Uh, we do the Bach beer, the Summer Pilsner's coming out uh, right as we speak, uh, Oktoberfest and a Porter. And then uh, 
continuing on with uh, the four phase plan I told everybody about, we opened local brewing operations in Cincinnati's uh, brewery district. And uh, this, is a, uh, this facility is actually a 19th century pre-prohibition brewery called the Kaufman Brewing Company. And we bought the build, we got a hold of the building, and then we, we, we were looking at uh, all of these great slides of, the, of, of history that people give us. And one of the things they give us was Sam Bourne insurance maps. And we looked at it, and we were looking at the building, and we were like, wow. Why is it we only know of three floors in this building, but this map says there's four? And we knocked out a wall and found in our building the largest underground loggering cellars in North America right now in Christian Moorline's building. And it's the craziest thing. And uh, there they are. There's some of them right there. Uh, but there's a whole network of it right underneath our building. It's really cool. Um, we also, uh, that's a picture of the outside of the building right there. Uh, this is Moore Street right here. That's, uh, let's see, this is Vine. This is Hamer. Uh, and then that's Walnut right over there. And the Shell Station would be right here. That's the top of the Shell Station. And we own all of that in there. And it's a 125,000 square foot facility. Uh, that we're rehabbing, and we're really, really happy to rehab it. We, matter of fact, we are opening uh, in this uh, facility, Memorial Day weekend, uh, our tap room, which is uh, being revitalized right now and has these beautiful arch ceilings. And uh, uh, we're not like a bar bar because we close earlier at night, but uh, if you stay, I'm sure we wouldn't kick you out. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we're really excited about that. A lot of fun things right there. Um, then uh, after we did that, we uh, decided to do this thing called the Moorline Logger House. Uh, and I don't know if you know what an RFP is or RFQ. I didn't know what it was at the time. And uh, I was looking for a site to put the Moorline Logger House in the banks. And I, I got a hold of a guy by the name of uh, 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 John Dietrich. Um, of, of, uh, he does like he's city and county. And I told him I wanted to open this Moorline Logger House in the riverfront, and, and I said, I don't know who to call and, and everything, and, and he, he tried to get me in touch with Carter Dawson, and I called them, and then I call him back, and I say, you know, they didn't really have the on-the-ground people here, so they weren't really ready for me. So he says to me, hey, you ever hear of what an RFQ is? And I was like, no, I don't know what that is. What is it? And he told me how to get on the website to figure it out, and it said, it said, uh, the Cincinnati Park Board is looking for a restaurant operator to open up like some sort of restaurant that has a connection to Cincinnati uh, between two stadiums and right next to Great American Ballpark on the riverfront that they're going to develop a $140 million park. And I was like, where do I sign up for that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, uh, so I called up my business advisor and I said, I said, uh, I called, his name was Mark. And I said, Mark, I said, hey, you got to check this out. And he, we're, we're I, I got this great site to put the Moorline Logger House. And, you know, this is what Cincinnati should have had all along. And he said, uh, he said, oh, that's, that's great, Greg. He goes, put it on our agenda. I said, no, 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 this, this RFQ is due on Monday. And he goes, Greg, he said, it's due Monday. When are we going to do it? It's Friday at 4 o'clock. I'm like, we're going to do it over the weekend. He goes, well, there's two problems. And I said, what's the problem? He said, number one, it says you have to have $4 million cash liquid right now. He goes, and I know what your balance sheet looks like. And I was like, all right, you got me there a little bit, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, he says, number two, he says, um, it says you have to be a proven restaurant operator. And you're neither one of those. And I said, I'm not sure I see the problem yet. What are you talking about? I, he said, well, I'll make you a deal. If you can show me where $4 million is and a restaurant operator that's going to run it for you, by noon tomorrow when I meet you for lunch, we'll spend the rest of the weekend and we'll write this RFQ. And so I walked in um, and uh, I basically showed him $4 million on the table and a restaurant operator. And I said, are we going to write it now? And he goes, I hate you. <laughs> so uh, uh, this, uh, this is a logger house, uh, if you haven't seen it. Um, it's uh, uh, basically, uh, it does have a working brewery in it. And uh, it is one of the largest brew pubs in the world by revenue. Um, we do have, a, uh, we do brew all our beer on site there. We do brew some other specialty beers at the brewery and ship it down there as well. 
Uh, we also have a, uh, uh, over 200 different styles of other people's beer in there as well. So I always heard when the Yard House was coming with 160, I was like, who cares? We got 200. We didn't care. <laughs> Plus, we, we have a brewery on site, you know? But, uh, and uh, I always love to show this picture. This is what the Logger House looked like in the renderings, you know, when you're putting it all together. And, and then uh, this is what it looks like real life in person. There we go. Um, big news for us, you know, you're building brands, um, you're bringing things back, you're making sure your plan's working. Uh, we just became the official beer of Taste of Cincinnati with Christian Moorline. They wanted to get a local craft beer involved, and so I took some of my money from the Logger House, and I said, let's go be the beer of Taste of Cincinnati. So uh, we went out and did it, and so we'll be There'll be many other beers, but we'll be the official beer there, and we're really, really excited about that. And uh, we're the official local beer at Bunbury Music Festival. Um, we won't have the most beer spots at Bunbury, but we'll, we'll be the one with the most crowded stands, hopefully. Um, so, like, when you achieve your plan, what do you do? <laughs> you know, I did my four-phase plan. I, I brought it back. Um, you know, it's successful. Things are working out well. Well, you lead by example. You follow your passion, but you have a plan. And I like history, so I like the Cincinnati uh, Historic Brewery District. Um, and, uh, you know, in that brewery district, uh, you know, our brewery is located there. It's in over the Rhine. And in 1860, there were 36 breweries operating in Cincinnati, 18 in OTR. From 1850 to 1919, which was the industrial era in Cincinnati, for those of you that don't know, you had heavy German immigrant populations that came to Cincinnati, and still to this day, 39% of the population in Cincinnati claims to have some form of German heritage. And Vine Street alone boasted 136 saloons with beer gardens, concert halls, and theaters. So uh, what's happening up there now is actually a natural progression. So, um, I decided to have a new passion. And my new passion is the Brewery District Master Plan. And uh, I had been a member of the Brewery District uh, from about 2005. And basically what happened with the Brewery District was, it was a group of like-minded individuals that got together, um, men and women, who were mostly developers at the time that were looking to develop buildings in the historic brewery district who literally wanted a better price on nails and drywall. And they wanted to get a little association together and a reason to go drink beer and talk about how much nails and drywall and plaster and demolition costs and all that type of stuff. I, you know, I showed up and I was like bored out of my mind. I was like, are you kidding me? Um, you know, there's business associations for that. So after Going along with that for a year or so, we all did a gut check in the room and because people were getting frustrated because it wasn't that business organization of where were you going to get a better price on construction materials. There were better B2B places to go for that. And we did a gut check and we went around the room and we said, why do you want to be on the board of the brewery district? And that person said, literally, like, I want to develop buildings. And then the next person said, I wanted to get a better price on drywall. And the next person said, I like the free beer. Uh, and, and, and we went around the room. And I said, I want to return Cincinnati's historic brewery district and create an economic tourism driver. And everybody in the room went, yeah, that's what we ought to be doing. And so that's what we did. And their like-minded individuals started getting together and we redid our mission statement. And we, in 2006, uh, we put together uh, the first version of a master plan, uh, which believe it or not, this group was the group that actually came up, uh, uh, we, we claim it at least, uh, well, with the idea of the streetcar. We, uh, it was this group that talked about it. And it was this group that came up with an original plan uh, uh, regarding all uh, a lot of things that are happening up uh, and over the Rhine uh, right now. And uh, uh, I was there. And our original master plan uh, is also, I believe, it's still published on our website. So you can go see all of that uh, and, and everything. So 
I was always kind of elected as a position in the, in the brewery district. It, you know, when, when there was a position open, you know, hey, who wants to be vice president? No one raised their hand. It was like, oh, okay, Greg, you're it, you know, and, and uh, but back in 2000, let's see, it was two and a half years ago, uh, I did raise my hand and said, I want to be the president of the brewery district. Will you elect me? Here's my platform. I will put together a strategic plan for the brewery district and I'll work with all the stakeholders in the area and I'll get everybody involved and I'll do it just like you do a business plan. And so everybody understands, you know, that we can get people rallied behind it and everything. Uh, and I'll raise the resources in order that your plan will come to life. And uh, everybody bought into it and elected me uh, to be the president of the brewery district. And this is the master plan that we came up with. Uh, the Brewery District Master Plan uh, had a lot of stakeholder participation. We invited uh, residents of the neighborhood. Um, we invited uh, uh, city leaders. Uh, we invited people from the Parks Department, the Recreation Department, uh, from uh, planning and so on and so forth, all the way down to business owners in the area. And we got them all in a room and we said, we said uh, to them, we said, hey, um, you know, let's have an open discussion. How about we all take notes and we're gonna turn those notes in to prove who was here, who said what, and everything. And basically, write down what you see in the area. And we put a huge graphic of, of, of over the Rhine in the brewery district. And people were like, this is a really bad drug corner. You know, hey, you pick your hookers up over here. Um, people get beat up and robbed at this corner. Four murders happened over here. Uh, we also had other comments that said, Liberty Street is like a massive thoroughfare and it cuts off over the Rhine from the development that's happening to the south to what's happening to the north. We should shrink Liberty Street. It's like, it's really hard to cross that street. Um, and on and on and on. And all of this is published at www.otrburydistrict.org under the master plan. And you will literally see in the master plan the notes of the people that attended. And sometimes there's curse words in there and sometimes it says nice things and other times it says not so nice things, but we did not sugarcoat it. Um, then we said, okay, well, now that we know these are the problems, how should it be? What are the suggestions of everybody? And we took, we split the areas out and we took everybody's suggestions of what they felt over the Rhine should be. And we put that into a master plan. And through a continuous working group, um, we whittled down all of their information and we came up with three areas that we need to work on uh, as a plan because the brewery district is a small nonprofit organization. We said, what are the things we can do as the brewery district that we can afford and be leaders on? What are the things that we need to partner with other people to do? And what are the things that we need to encourage others to do to bring the brewery district to life to create you know, an economic tourism driver in our city and also you know, to make it much more uh, uh, revitalization efforts and, and vitality? And uh, this is the plan we came up with. So uh, we came up with, uh, under We'll Do It, brand, uh, Brewing Heritage Trail. We felt like uh, 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 if, if, if Kentucky can have the Bourbon Trail and Boston can have the Freedom Trail, and why can't Cincinnati have the Brewing Heritage Trail highlighting all of our great sites? Branding and gateways, we can do that. And then under partnering, uh, polish, uh, polishing recreation facilities, rediscovering a mixed use economy, economy, Brewers Triangle, neighborhood zoning and historic districts, and encouraging complete streets and parking and placemaking. That's what city government does, by the way. This is their job. But it's your job to tell them what to do. If you don't talk and get involved, it ain't gonna happen. So that's my passion. Uh, so Brewing Heritage Trail. So we get a bunch of beer drinkers and I see some of them here in this room um, that uh, get involved <laughs> in everything. And uh, we identify all the Brewing Heritage sites in Cincinnati. And lo and behold, what do they tell me? And I didn't know this. 
But right by this thing right here, which is called the Moorline Lager House, they proceed to tell me that the first commercial brewery in Cincinnati is literally located within 150 feet of my front door. It started in 1829, known as the Davis Embry Brewery, and it was the first commercial brewery in Cincinnati on the riverfront. And lo and behold, of all things, right outside the front door of the Horseshoe Casino is unbelievable amounts of brewing heritage literally right there uh, with a whole bunch of breweries there and everything. So we got them involved and we said, hey, why don't you come listen to our brewery district plan? I grabbed Kevin Klein, who's the uh, vice president or general manager, I'm not sure what he is. And I said, hey, come check this out, man. And then all of a sudden, you know what? He goes, you know what? We had no idea. So then they start putting brewing heritage stuff in the casino and they start paying attention. They start paying attention to their community. Why? Because I got active. That's how you do it. You don't sit on your ass and expect good things to happen. You get up and do stuff. And then so in any event, all these really cool sites, and uh, I didn't design any of them. There's a committee that does that. And then along the way, um, you know, you figure out that you got these really good opportunities for branding and gateways. Uh, this is Liberty Street. Um, Liberty, Central Parkway, uh, McMicken, Vine. And so you get all these great gateways where you could identify a brewery district. Again, have a trail, have a marked area, helps economic commerce. People feel like, wow, I want to be located in the brewery district. And, 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 and uh, you can seek investment. And then uh, polishing uh, recreational facilities. It was amazing. We figured out that we actually have a lot of playgrounds in the brewery district. But what we also found out that of all those playgrounds that were listed, there was exactly one tree. One tree. And so we were like, hey, is there any reason why there's no shade in any of these parks? And everyone was like, oh, I don't know. Go ask the police. They would probably know. We went and asked the police. They're like, oh, drug dealers. We're like, what? Do your job. You know, it's like, you know. <laughs> but so in any event, someone's got to talk to somebody this way. And I do it well, I guess. Or somebody, you know, you just talk sense to people is what you do. But in any event, um, one tree. And so I believe it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, we got a grant and they, and they planted at Grant Park right here, which this is my brewery, by the way, this whole complex right here. Uh, they planted 20 trees in Grant Park last week, the brewery district. Why? Because we got off our ass and did something. We told our government what we wanted to have done. We explained ourselves. We had a plan, followed our passion, and went out and asked. It's amazing how that works. Um, then you have this rediscovering a mixed use economy. I am so tired, I'm wore out actually, of everybody walking up going, I wanna have a brewery in the brewery district. Well, hell, so do I, you know? But those buildings can't stand weight loads. They don't have things called utilities coming in. Tap-in fees are hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, you, you, it, it, it's crazy, but they make really great lofts, artesian businesses. You live up above, you have a storefront, you don't need foot traffic going by. You think of better ways to utilize things, okay? And they're great deals up there. But, you know, I, if I had a dollar for every time someone said they wanted to open a brewery in the brewery district, I'd probably be able to buy at least a beer at the logger house, but, uh, but, 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 but seriously, it's, I'd be able to buy a lot of beers. But the point is, you have to rediscover what these buildings are best used for, okay? Um, and breweries back in the day were tiny. Now, you know, they, they put tanks and vats that have huge weight loads on a little piece of metal that goes on the floor, and you have four of those pieces of metal that hold up this huge tank. They gotta be able to hold like 500 pounds per square foot. It costs a lot of money to shore those things up. So anyhow, Brewer's Triangle. Um, this section, um, I had to hold myself out of the meetings on uh, because I was anti this being one of the objectives because that is my brewery. Uh, and Brewer's Triangle, here's the Shell Station. This is, this is St. Francis School. This is Vine Street. This is Liberty, Shell Station. Uh, they wanted to make it so 
they, the Brewer's Triangle basically is, my loading docks are in the back by where it says production brewery, but if I actually use that, then I shut off all these uses for Hamer Street, which is kind of a, you know, a problem alley at the moment. Um, and uh, uh, so the concept was, if I didn't bring semis down there and I moved it to the front of my building, uh, this becomes a much more utilized space to get things happening and going in this area uh, and everything. So it's kind of a redevelopment process here. We do have an event center at the brewery. Some of you may have been to this thing called Bachfest. Uh, that is the Christian Moorline Event Center. And right next to that, the room with the arch ceilings is going to be the tap room. So people wanted me, they said, Greg, the other side of the building on Moore Street isn't that nice when this is the original Kaufman Brewery. Why don't we make that the front of your brewery? And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. So in any event, they made suggestions to me on what I should do there. Um, neighborhood zoning in historic districts. Craziest thing of all, we're going to this thing called form-based code. I don't know if any of you know what it is. I'll give it to you in a layman's way. Basically says that you want to have buildings of like things that are lined up next to each other that are supposed to fit and look like they're supposed to fit there. You know, instead of it, you know, being, you know, stupid things, buildings next to historic buildings and, you know, that sort of thing. Well, we figured out that in the middle of the brewery district, People are tearing these buildings down and they're not even in the historic district. So we need to change the laws of the historic district, not because we're trying to prevent people to tear buildings down, which is exactly what we're trying to do, but we're trying to get them more resources. Because if you're in a historic district, you can get low interest loans, tax credits, those type of things, okay? That's why we're doing that. So again, we have a plan. Um, I love this slide. This is my favorite slide. This is Liberty Street. This is complete streets. And uh, if you notice, <clears throat> these buildings right here that are all black roofs, these are not there. They're fake buildings that we put in. And if you go on Liberty Street between Central Parkway and Reading, I'm sorry, Central Parkway and Sycamore, um, for years, we were asking uh, 3CDC um, uh, to come up north of Liberty, and to their credit, to their credit, they said, no, we have to focus south of Liberty to make, you know, the best economic impact. Someday we'll get there. So what we did was we actually did a survey of Liberty Street, and if you look at it, it has a very jagged edge on the south side of Liberty Street. The buildings go like that. So I was very happy to point out to 3CDC and Steve Leeper um, that on the south side of Liberty, between Central Parkway and Sycamore, there happens to be four acres of developable land. Hey, south of Liberty. You said you were saying south of Liberty, right? So sometimes you just got to point things out. It's amazing. But if you could get this to be all storefronts and cafes and actually make Liberty Street instead of this major thoroughfare, but you do bump out curbs and you reduce the lanes and you put a bike lane in. And nobody drives like through Liberty Street to go from 75 to 71 like they thought they were going to do back in 1960. They, everybody drives around that I know, you know? Only people that live there go there. Uh, you actually could have a really viable street and a great economic driver in the middle of Over the Rhine, linking the South with the North. Um, then you have this thing called parking and placemaking. Um, you know, if you had a chance to uh, um, put parking in its most strategic area, okay, um, it would be in an area where you could actually have private citizens be able to benefit from it development of housing. Businesses use it for people that work in jobs during the day. Businesses that use it, that party their brains out at night, and on and on and on. So you try to place these things in great areas that have the best impact because you know that people only go so far to walk to these parking garages. Parking studies tell you that. So 
I always wondered, why does it make sense to put a parking garage way out on Central Parkway when you could put it a little closer in the heart of Over the Rhine and more people could benefit? Now, we're not trying to say where to put parking. We're just trying to say having a parking study and understanding that would be a really cool thing to get it right the first time. So parking and placemaking is something that would be really encouraging uh, to do it uh, to help economic uh, growth. So um, basically uh, capitalizing on our historic resources, uh, we can repopulate the brewery district with residents, tourists and visitors and businesses. And uh, this is uh, the two major economic centers in Cincinnati. One is downtown by the riverfront and one is the universities and the hospitals. And that little green area in the middle is your historic brewery district. Isn't that amazing? So it's a great way to link these together. Hey, and here's my new beer hall. So I need you all to stop by there, Memorial Day weekend, and have a beer with me. Uh, and then, uh, but it's linking those two centers into creating a greater economic mass for all of us. <clears throat> So thank you for your time, follow your passion, and great things will happen. Appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Does anyone have any questions? Surely you have questions. With uh, Cincinnati's uh, deep German heritage and Christian Moorlein's um, status as the first uh, purity certified um, brand. Have you thought about playing that into your marketing message at all? Um, we do, um, but haven't really lately, because uh, um, it's just one of those things where uh, um, we, we do say it, but we don't say it probably enough. It can be hard to do elegantly. We have some really cool things coming up in the fall. You'll see it a little bit more and everything. Um, as a successful microbrewery and somebody who's been in the business for so long, what is uh, Christian Moorline doing to help promote diversity in the craft brewery scene in Cincinnati to help encourage more diversity and other small craft breweries in the area in addition to Moorline itself? Well, I, I think that's uh, um, a really good question. And uh, we do a couple of things. Actually, we do more than a couple of things. Um, and uh, you should ask that question of every other brewer uh, as well, of what are they doing to help that community uh, in that. But what we're doing specifically is, is uh, we put their beers on tap down at our logger house. We share our lab with all the other local brewers. We have a very good lab. Uh, when we put their beer on, we test it. We tell them if they want to know the results and that sort of thing. Uh, we do share uh, malt and hops with some of them uh, and yeast when they need it. Uh, we also... Uh, uh, do uh, collaboration brews sometimes uh, with the other brewers, uh, as well as uh, um, we uh, um, we turned our sponsorship at Finley Market over to where that they would be able to get in on a craft beer series through the summer, which is another thing we did. So every third Wednesday, another local brewer will be featured other than just our beers. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that was something that, uh, you know, we didn't have to do, but we did. And um, I'd say, uh, you know, we share education with them a lot. Um, my question is, well, really beginning with a comment. I, I live in OTR, I've been there for almost nine years and lived on Ray Street when bullets were buzzing by my, my windows. So I've, I've seen the redevelopment. Um, but one of the things that I have yet to see is an art house in downtown and, and back in the historic days, um, there were art houses, movie art houses all over the place. And um, I'm really excited about this discussion of re, re, um, reinvigorating the brewery dress district. And there is a little art house there at, on Mohawk Street. And I know right now it's, I believe, used by a church for storage. But are there any discussions about maybe revitalizing an art house or, or some kind of multi-use art center facility? that type of thing? Um, we don't determine what other people would put into these areas. We only bring to life that it's available and that they should move in and there's resources to help them to move in. Um, but uh, I don't know of any uh, per se, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't encourage it because uh, we're clearly 
trying to create a mixed use economy uh, and art houses would fit right into that. But uh, what the market determines on what goes in, that's what the market bears. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the streetcar project. I, I've just moved back to Cincinnati after being gone for two years. Uh, in my opinion, it seems like it's a gigantic, just, you know, debacle. What are your feelings and how, can, how come someone like you is, can't make this happen and what, 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 what's, what's the current status? Do I have to have hard questions? <laughs> All right, you ready? Um, if uh, you invested, uh, if I told you, you could invest $800 today, and in 10 years, I'll give back to you $60,000 plus an interest stream, a revenue stream of additional dollars coming back to you, would you invest? That's what $150 million is to $3.5 billion in economic development and an increased tax base. That's exactly what it is. It is a good business decision to do this. Not to mention, I have a Moorline Logger House on one end of the streetcar and a production brewery on the other. <laughs> Why lie? <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but seriously, that's, that's, that's what it is. It's that investment. I think we're short-sighted in this city. Uh, it's so easy to say, cut, 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 cut. Hell, if I didn't invest in all these brands, they'd be nowhere today. If I didn't take the risk and do it, it'd be nowhere today. Let's get behind this and stop the BS. And all these people that are saying, cut, 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 and I'm gonna you know, take firemen and policemen off the street, that's bullshit, okay? Straight up bullshit. One is a capital expense and one is an operating budget. So I should be mayor for God's sakes. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I know that uh, we're trying to pass the brewery district plan that you see here uh, through city council and the planning commission and all that, and we've had great success. I've learned that by dealing with uh, politicians, uh, I like to have civil conversations and normal conversations, and I always make it a business conversation. And you know what? You know what? I, I, I always love when they, you know, you can tell when someone's BSing you and they're trying to run for political office. But, you know, look at the investment, look at the return, and look at what it'll do for your city. And all great cities around the country have public transportation. You know, go, go, to, go to Europe, although they're a little more socialist than I'd like to be. But uh, uh, I, I, do like, I do like that I can hop on public transportation. It's a great investment for our city. I don't know why people talk, don't talk more about it. Hey, if I'm, if I'm off by a billion, it's still a great return. I'm off by two billion it's still a great return. And I know one thing, it will increase your tax base and get this city to get back on its feet because this is what Cincinnati needs to do. So you gotta increase your tax base. It's not like a, you know, I always read in the Inquirer that, you know, why don't we have a business person running? I don't know, you know, we should. Because if you were looking at numbers that I'm looking at, and that's a calculated risk. I put the Moorline Logger House up as a calculated risk. It was a $10 million bet. And you know what? I'm glad I made it. And I got another $6 million bet sitting up the street that I'm glad I made it in that. And I'm hoping our city makes a $150 million bet because I think that if you don't put your money up to get this stuff done correctly, you're gonna end up with you know, a subway that wasn't done, and we could have been, if you look at the history, uh, a great top 10 city in America, you know, in that if we would have invested properly back then. So I don't view it as a Republican or a Democratic issue. I believe it's smart. It's like parking and placemaking and complete streets. It's what cities should do. 
They should invest in your, in, in your economic well-being. So, hope I answered it. <laughs> My question, uh, I was just really happy to, I used to work in uh, one of the parks in a downtown, or over the Rhine, and uh, I was really happy to hear that you planted some trees because they really needed it. And I just wanted to know, is there any other, like, I, I guess what's your vision for the other parks in the brewery district down there? Um, we have a separate committee. All of these, each one of these objectives that you saw that, again, I can only encourage you to go to www.otrbrewerydistrict.org, click on master plan. Uh, each one of those objectives has a board member um, that ha is, is in charge of that objective. Now, we do prioritize our objectives because we only have limited resources. We are working on all the objectives all the time, but we prioritize these objectives. So, in any event, um, I, I don't know specifics because I'm like the leader of the organization and I don't know them all, but uh, uh, I could put you in touch with someone that uh, would know. Uh, her name's Jen Walkie and she's in charge of that committee. And uh, uh, I know that they are working on uh, more fencing, some more swings and more trees in some of the other parks and they're directly engaging uh, the Cincinnati Recreation Commission on, uh, you know, everybody cries, I don't have money, I don't have money, I don't have money. And I always say, well, how much is it that you need? Oh, well, then they got to actually do work, you know, so, uh, but, you, you know, that's kind of what you do is you ask the question, then you, you weigh the advantages and disadvantages, like the streetcar. You ask the question, you figure out the funding sources, you weigh, you weigh the advantages and disadvantages. You're going to borrow the money, you're going to put a bond out, you know, what are you going to do? I'm sorry, I didn't have a better answer for you. So, uh. I live in Clifton, um, and it, I, I'm very interested in having um, the, the near uptown neighborhoods be uh, viable residential areas that are still within the city. Um, and I, I feel like a big part of what holds that back uh, is that they need downtown to survive. Um, they need the city center to be viable, um, and the brewery district is kind of, it's that no man's land in between, right? Um, so I feel like you know a revitalization in there um, creates a, a, a better link for us to downtown um, and kind of makes those be more viable residential areas. Have you talked to any groups like the Uptown Consortium that are uh, trying to keep those neighborhoods uh, in good shape to, to try to pitch that kind of angle? I am. Um I'm the president of the brewery district. We do have an executive director. Uh, he does engage uh, the other executive directors from these groups and everything. Uh, I think that it's a natural type of thing, though, that you know you have a strong uptown and the investment up there, and obviously you can see what's going on downtown in the banks on the riverfront and with the park going in. You know the the park is spectacular. I mean, if you haven't been down there recently, uh, they're almost done with the first phase, and it's unbelievable right now. But uh, these are great economic centers for us. And um, in the middle of it happens to be your historic district. And, you know, I kind of always look at, uh, there was a guy by the name of Mike Morgan, who uh, is a buddy of mine. He's a lawyer and he's an activist and he's a pain in the ass. Um, but uh, he, uh, uh, he showed a slide one time and, and, and it basically said, the slide was like, he'd show one slide and it would say, it show, you know, it would show over the Rhine and it would show this beautiful Italianate architecture uh, on it. And then he'd show Charleston and it would be the same thing. Then he'd go back to over the Rhine, this beautiful wrought iron on these buildings and, and, and everything. Then he'd go to Charleston, beautiful wrought iron. And then he'd show, you know, over the Rhine, a vacant building. Then he'd show Charleston, this unbelievable storefront. So they get it. They invest through tax credits. You know, ask your government for your money back, you know, so you can put it into your businesses. Uh, and and, and they, they've invested through, you know, great historic districts and, and invested in their community and in preservation and those type of things. And uh, they... They are now a great economic tourism place to go. And uh, so I think you have to, you have to link them all. Because if you can link them all, you create an economic driver 
that puts this city on a plane of growth for many, many years to come, in my opinion. Hope I answered your question. All right. Greg, thank you very much for okay, being here. Thanks.